So you've probably heard of the metal manganese, but did you know that manganese is in fact one of the most used metals in the world? It's essential for the production of steel. It's also increasingly used in batteries for electric vehicles. Geologically speaking, manganese ore formation is also quite a special process. So let's have a look at manganese. Manganese is the most widely consumed metal in the world after iron and aluminium, but most of its uses are hidden from view. Over 90% of the manganese used annually goes into metallurgical applications, primarily steel making. In fact, you can't make steel without manganese. Adding manganese to the alloy is essential to remove impurities such as sulfur and oxygen which weaken the steel. You only need a couple of percent manganese in steel to make it stronger, but for applications that need very strong steel, up to around 13% manganese can be added. Other applications for manganese include animal feeds and fertilizers, colouring agents in bricks, ceramics and paints, or as an oxidizing agent in the chemical industry. And of course, manganese is used in certain types of batteries. So manganese is very important for our modern society and it's increasingly important now with the development of new battery technologies. Manganese is already used widely in batteries. For example, you probably have a lithium-ion manganese oxide battery in your phone or laptop and most electric cars are powered by lithium-ion batteries with nickel-manganese-cobalt cathodes. In fact, manganese is as important as the lithium, nickel and cobalt in these batteries as the performance and the stability of lithium batteries would not be the same without these other metals. But manganese is set to become more and more important for battery technologies. Many new battery technologies are being developed that rely on manganese. For example, lithium manganese iron phosphate batteries would have up to 15% higher energy density than conventional lithium batteries with the same cost of production. Manganese is much cheaper than most other metals used in batteries, particularly lithium and cobalt. So high performance batteries that use more manganese and less other metals would be a significant advancement. So manganese rich batteries would make electric cars, for example, cheaper and increase their performance. And of course, we will need a lot more manganese to produce the steel that is needed in low carbon energy production, particularly in wind turbines and other infrastructure requiring high strength steel. As we move away from fossil fuels, the rapidly increasing volume of battery manufacturing, the development of new manganese rich batteries, and just the sheer volume of building infrastructure relying on steel, mean that the demand for manganese is projected to increase. According to various markets analysts, demand for manganese to produce batteries is expected to increase dramatically in the next few years. Well, let's now have a look at the geology of manganese deposits. I'm visiting southern Portugal, but there's no active manganese mining here today, but there are some old mines and deposits that we can have a look at. Come on. Portugal is most famous for the copper and zinc deposits within the Iberian Pyrus belt that stretches all the way from southern Spain to Portugal. These deposits are so-called volcanogenic massive sulphide, or VMS, deposits, forming in an ancient rift basin hundreds of millions of years ago. But the processes resulting in the VMS deposits were also favourable for manganese ore formation. In fact, dozens of small manganese deposits have been historically mined in Portugal and Spain. I'm visiting the site of the Sierra da Mina, also known as the Cersal mine. 
This was the last Portuguese manganese mine to close in 2001. Well, <laughs> hard to believe it now, but this was actually the main access route to the mine. The access to the main mine has been well and truly blocked off. You can't even see the entrance anymore, which is probably just as well. Old mines can be very dangerous places. So let's have a look around to see if we can find any signs of the ore mineralization elsewhere. Aha, uh -huh. looks like there's something up here. There is a nice little outcrop that has clearly seen some mining activity. The manganese ore here, like in most manganese deposits globally, consisted of manganese oxides, primarily pyrolusite. So let's have a look around to see what the rocks look like. The rocks here consist of volcanic and sedimentary layers that deposited into the old rift basin. So the sedimentary layering is now tilted like that. You can still see the original sedimentary packages uh, in this outcrop here. And the miners clearly targeted a very specific, a couple of meters thick layer in that sedimentary package. It's diving into the darkness over there. The mining clearly continued to some depth, but as I don't have appropriate safety equipment with me, I'd better stay here in the open. Plenty to look at even at the outcrop. Well, you can still find bits and bobs of the ore station here, lying around. Interesting textures. There is, of course, some pyrolusite, which was the main ore mineral. And apart from manganese minerals, there are also other minerals that tell us something about the ore forming conditions. Like here, it looks like we have a little pebble of manganese oxide, probably pyrolusite, and it's surrounded by this reddish and then grey quartz here, which is of course a silicon oxide. But we also have some iron oxides like hematite. So the presence of oxide minerals tells us there must have been a lot of oxygen around when these minerals formed. So most metallic ores do need sulfur to actually form the ore deposits and the, the metallic minerals. But manganese, it's a bit special because it needs not sulfur, but oxygen. Let's first have a look at how manganese behaves chemically. Manganese can react with sulfur, but it much prefers oxygen, but only in very specific conditions. We can use this diagram to illustrate this. It shows the acidity of water on the x-axis, so the pH, and the oxygen content or oxidation reduction potential EH on the y-axis. So less acidic waters are to the right of the diagram and more oxygen-rich waters are to the top of the diagram. Manganese dissolves easily into more acidic waters, which is typical for surface waters on continents and for hydrothermal waters originating from underwater volcanic vents or so-called black smokers. Oceanic water is less acidic in comparison, but also typically less oxidizing. So most oceanic water is also within the manganese solubility field. So in these conditions, Manganese sits there happily in solution as manganese ions. But there are differences in the water chemistry depending on where you are in the ocean. If either the pH or the oxidation state of the water change, manganese minerals start to precipitate. If the pH rises, for example, via introduction of carbonate-rich sediments, Manganese precipitates as manganese carbonate minerals if the conditions are relatively reducing. 
but if there's a lot of oxygen present, manganese ions combine more readily with oxygen to form manganese oxides such as pyrolusite. So manganese ore deposits consist mainly of manganese oxides such as pyrolusite. So the manganese ions that exist in a solution in the hydrothermal and basinal fluids, they combine with oxygen to form the manganese ore. So you need that sort of contrast in oxygen content, so you need oxygen poor areas and oxygen rich areas in deep in the oceanic basins. You need that contrast that ultimately drives the manganese ore deposition. So where do you get such contrasts in the oxygen content within basins? Let's look at the ore deposit types a bit more closely. Manganese deposits in sedimentary basins are usually divided into hydrothermal deposits formed via volcanogenic activity and sedimentary deposits. The sources for manganese and the causes for the oxygen gradients are quite different in each case. Let's look at the hydrothermal deposits first. These form near underwater volcanic centers, such as mid-ocean ridges. The high heat flow around these volcanic centers results in circulation of hot fluids within the oceanic crust. These hot waters leach metals and elements from the rocks, including manganese. When the hot metal-rich fluids reach the sea floor, most metals combine readily with the sulphur and precipitate as sulphide minerals. These can form valuable ore deposits called volcanogenic massive sulphide deposits or VMS deposits for many important metals such as zinc, lead and copper. And this is indeed the deposit type that dominates the Iberian pyrite belt. But manganese doesn't care much about the sulphur, it prefers oxygen. The waters deep in the rift basin and particularly near the hydrothermal vents are quite poor in oxygen and they are quite acidic as well. So the manganese stays in solution and gets carried away from the vents by ocean currents. Some manganese minerals do often precipitate relatively close to the vent, but much of it moves elsewhere, and once these manganese-bearing waters reach a more oxygen-rich and less acidic part of the ocean, the manganese minerals can precipitate. In fact, a similar process can happen with another common metal, namely iron, although iron also forms sulphide minerals near the vents. But iron also reacts easily with oxygen to form iron oxides, which is why you often find both manganese and iron oxides together, just like we did at the Sersal mine. But manganese is still quite soluble, even in most oceanic waters, so it can move hundreds of kilometers from the volcanic source to deposits elsewhere as sediments. That's why VMS-hosted manganese deposits are generally quite small, with very few being economic these days. More than 90% of manganese mined today comes from the other main manganese deposit type hosted in sediments. Let's see how these form. Oceanic basins are often stratified so that the deeper waters are usually reducing, whilst the more Sufficient waters are oxidizing. This contrast forms an ideal environment for manganese deposition. The manganese in these systems can be sourced from various places. It can originate by upwelling from greater depths, typically initially sourced from hydrothermal activity deeper in the basin, or it can flow with the more acidic surface waters from the continent. In other cases, the manganese exists in the poor waters of the slightly reducing basin sediments themselves, and it can be mobilized from there and moved towards the sea floor where the conditions are more oxidizing. Manganese oxides and other minerals then precipitate near the sea floor as manganese nodules, 
or as layers of manganese minerals at the interface of the oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor water. Manganese carbonates, on the other hand, precipitate deeper in more reducing conditions. So there is a critical depth for manganese enrichment that produces a kind of a bathtub ring around the margins of the basin. So as sedimentary basins are typically very large, tens or even hundreds of kilometers across, manganese deposits formed in these settings can be very large as well. So where are these major deposits today then? So manganese minerals are quite common here in Portugal, for example, and indeed many of the smaller deposits have been historically mined. But today, manganese mining is concentrated in very few countries. Smaller manganese deposits are quite common, but large land-based mineable grade manganese deposits are unevenly distributed. They are situated in places where ancient ocean basins have been caught up in mountain building processes so that they are now no longer under the oceans but forming a part of the continents. South Africa, China and Australia are the largest producers of manganese ore globally. Manganese refining is, on the other hand, dominated by China, who processes over 95% of world's manganese ore. So should we be concerned about the availability of manganese and look for new alternative sources? Well, manganese deposits are forming deep under the ocean, even today. In fact, there are companies and countries that are considering mining these deep sea manganese and other metal deposits. And that, of course, is not only technically difficult, but hugely controversial. Black smokers and other manganese deposit forming processes are operating even in the modern oceans. And the ocean floor has been estimated to have 500 billion tons of manganese nodules alone. The idea is that these deposits may be reached by a combination of techniques such as drilling, dredging and pumping. The trouble is that many of these areas also host rich marine ecosystems that we still know very little about. The National Geographic Society has calculated that a far greater percentage of the surfaces of the Moon and the planet Mars have been mapped and studied than of our own ocean floor. Without a good understanding of oceanic ecosystems, it will be very difficult to prevent environmental damage of deep sea mining, as we cannot really see the impact of our activities at such great depths. And the fact is that we still have quite a lot of manganese reserves on land. The USGS in 2021 estimated that about one and a half million tons of manganese reserves still exist on land. So there seems little point in deep sea mining for manganese if it means more environmental damage. Well, perhaps in the future, we can't avoid but to mine these deep sea deposits. But in the meantime, I think we should focus on the onshore deposits where we can actually see what we're doing and can more easily limit the environmental damage. Certainly for manganese, we've got plenty of reserves.